uh, Professor Lindsay LeBlanc. Um, she is uh, a, a professor in the Department of Physics at the University of Alberta. She's been there since 2013. Um, and she's actually, I think, originally from that area. Uh, she got her PhD at the University of Toronto in 2010. Uh, and I was intrigued to note that she won the DAMFI thesis prize, which is given every two years for the best doctoral thesis in atomic and molecular uh, physics in Canada. Um, she did a postdoc at the Joint Quantum Institute in Maryland from 2010 to 2013, and then joined the University of Alberta Physics Department after that. Um, since she's been there, she's made uh, remarkable uh, advances. I think she has the most northern coldest place in Canada. I'm not sure I'm saying this right. Uh, she's managed to, <laughs> managed to create BEC, uh, the farthest north, uh, I believe. Um, she's been the AITF Strategic Chair in Hybrid Quantum Systems, a Canada Research Chair in Ultra Cold Gases for Quantum Simulation, and a CIFAR Fellow in the Quantum Materials Program. Um, so I'm very excited to hear about what she has to say about atomic quantum memory and manipulation in the Otler Towns regime. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to uh, speak. I was actually supposed to come in April, I guess, but of course that didn't happen. So um, this is, you know, I'm actually enjoying the being able to connect with people remotely. It's been really great. So it's nice to see some familiar faces and hopefully meet some new ones today. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk about some of the experiments we've done over the last couple of years um, in one area of my lab. So um, we actually do a number of different things, as Lily kind of touched on, um, one of which is sort of BECs and quantum simulation, which I won't talk about too much today. Um, but yes, we do have uh, the capability of making uh, Bose-Einstein condensates or iridium in my lab. And I think, I don't know for the northernmost, just because European cities tend to be quite far north. And so I think there's some Scandinavian um, who might beat us on that, but I, I did look up the average temperatures of all cities in January, and I think we're definitely the coldest city that has a BEC, so I think we get a head start, and uh, so we're the coldest city with cold atoms, is what I like to say. Um, so that's sort of my background and where we started, but one area that we've got into since I moved here is uh, working with at atomic quantum memory, and that's in part due to some collaborations with the University of Calgary, where there's a lot of expertise around that there, um, and so we've developed that in our lab as well. Uh, hybrid quantum systems are another area that's nascent. We're really working on hardware with respect to this. So one thing we're trying to do is to couple uh, a dilution refrigerator designed by John Davis with uh, the ultra cold atoms apparatus designed by me and actually mash these things together to try to get cold atoms into a cryogenic environment. And so it's an ambitious project and we're really just, yeah, working out the engineering of that right now. And then time remaining, I might talk a little bit at the end about another project we've got going on, which is working with warm atoms actually in microwave cavities and looking at how we can address um, the hyperfine transitions of atoms for more sort of technological purposes, um, including things like transduction of signals between microwave and optical um, regimes. So, so there's a, a number of different things going on, but I do want to focus today on just one, which is the idea of quantum memory. And so uh, for those who might not be familiar with it, the idea of a quantum memory is that you have some kind of medium and then it can be a number of different things where what we want to do is send some kind of input signal, ideally something that has got quantum information encoded in it in some way, whether that's polarization or, or frequency or time bin or something. And then we want to store that information in the medium. So we need some kind of uh, quantum degree of freedom, store it for some time, and then after that amount of time, sort of retrieve it. So we can kind of think of this as sort of almost like a, a random access memory or something like that, um, but in the, in the quantum regime. And so um, we can use some kind of control mechanism, in our case, a laser, to turn it on and off. Uh, this is not a new idea by any means. Um, some of the first ideas around using atoms for quantum memory in particular came uh, about 20 years ago now. Um, but there are a number of different systems that people are working in for uh, quantum memory, including warm atoms, uh, the cold atoms that we work on, but also things like ion doped solids. Um, so you can think about like a terbium and fibers or terbium and crystals, for example, or uh, sort of more solid state uh, things like Lily's familiar with um, working in color centers or NV centers. Uh, so there's lots of different systems and all these have in common is that there's some quantum degree of freedom that allows you to store the superposition states that make up the quantum information. In addition to the number of different platforms that you can do this on, there's also different ways to do it. And so there's a different mechanisms that one might use to do quantum memory. And sort of traditionally, these have been separated into two different regimes. One we might call an adiabatic memory, and this is related to electromagnetically transparency usually, 
or you actually make use of the fact that there's a dark state. So what you want to do is actually store your state um, as a spin coherence between, say, two levels where you've accessed those levels through a dark state. So there's been no chance of actually exciting things to an excited state. Um, and there are other methods, including this one called off-resonant Raman that uses a similar method, but far, far detuned. In contrast, you can also do something called a fast memory where light is actually absorbed. And you can think of this kind of memory as sort of a number of different dipoles, each of which has its own phase evolution. And then you manipulate the phase evolution so that uh, at some well-defined point in time, the phases all realign with one another and you get um, a large dipole moment and you get re-emission of the light. And so you sort of, the input signal will set those uh, phase oscillators in motion. They will oscillate coherently. And then when they re-phase with one another, you get your output signal. And so that's generally called a fast memory because using the absorption method, you're able to do it quite quickly as opposed to the adiabatic uh, conditions that limit you for the adiabatic memories. So there's a number of different ways you can I, sort of um, judge the performance of these different memories, including efficiency, uh, storage time, what kind of bandwidth the memory has and how much noise it has or how sure you are that the signal that you're getting out actually was the same as the signal that you put in. And these all sort of depend on the method and the platform. And so to date, there's really nothing that hits all of these really well. And so um, there's still research, a lot of research going in and trying to make better the different platforms and to combine the systems to get the best of all worlds here. So what I want to talk about today is um, what we call the Altler Towns protocol. So this is a protocol that we have implemented in an atomic physics platform that combines aspects of both fast and slower adiabatic memories. Um, and so in this way, we realize a quantum memory that's broadband, it's quite low noise, it's fairly efficient, and it's capable in principle of long storage times. And we're working on that part of it right now. So what we've been able to do with this is really hit a lot of these uh, metrics and try to improve uh, sort of overall the performance of the memory, even if in any one of them, maybe we're not the best in the world, but we've, we've hit a lot of the different metrics in the process here. So um, here's a bit of an outline for the rest of the talk. Uh, I wanna go over sort of the basic physics behind this Ottler Towns protocol, tell you why it has that name. Uh, and look at our calculations around its performance, and then we'll go through some of the experimental demonstrations of this method. So let me just see here. Um, so yes, let's focus to start on the Ottler Towns protocol. So the problem, again, going back to the very basics of what a quantum memory is, is to ask how do you transfer a qubit, or some quantum information that lives in photonic degrees of freedom, and then um, couple that to some atomic degree of freedom so that you've actually mapped the state from the photonic degrees of freedom to the atomic degrees of freedom. Um, what we're going to do is consider a three level system. So this is very generic. It can be in an atom as we do it, but it could also be in any other sort of quantum system that has the same kind of level structure. And this will look very familiar to anybody who's familiar with electromagnetically induced transparency. In fact, it is the same sort of scheme that's used there. Um, the advantage of this kind of scheme is that in the atomic case, we are going to make use of what we call a forbidden transition. So this is um, two levels in the ground state, and they are not connected by an electric dipole matrix element. So that means that there's, it's forbidden in the sense that there's no electric dipole transition between these levels. And what that means is if you can park um, populations in these two levels, they're very long lived. In fact, you, you, if you want to go ahead and calculate it, it's something like 10 to the 15 seconds if everything were perfect in the background. So, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's, it's infinite. And in that way, we want to have a storage state that could last as long as we can do it technically, where the superposition is between these two ground states. So that's the aim is to have it stored, uh, the information stored there. To connect them, because that transition is forbidden, we're going to use two other uh, mechanisms. One we're going to have as our signal transition. So here's where uh, we couple in information um, that we want to store, and then we're going to use another transition as our control transition. So we actually consider the signal as a quantum field and the control transition as a classical field, although of course you could consider everything quantum if you wanted to. Um, but in fact, in our regime that we're going to use, this is going to be a strong, a strong signal. So uh, moving forward, if we want to think about um, the mechanism for storage, what uh, is actually helpful to do is consider what we call coherences. So we're going to consider two coherences. One is the polarization coherence, and this is the sort of 
superposition between the ground and this excited state. And so you can quantify that with this operator, which measures basically how much superposition there is between the ground and an excited state. And this polarization is going to couple directly to the signal field. So you send in a signal field, you're going to uh, excite this polarization coherence. Uh, in contrast, we can also look at the spin coherence. So this is the same thing. It's just how much superposition exists between these two ground states. And we can define an operator which measures that. And uh, that's going to be the storage. So we can kind of think of the polarization as the input signal and the spin coherence is being related to the storage. And now what we want to do is consider the dynamics between the two of them. So um, by establishing a control field between these two levels here, if we just had these two levels, E and S, and we had a strong electromagnetic field coupling them, um, the sort of simple dynamics that would happen would be a Rabi flopping oscillation. So we would imagine, say, if you started in the S state, that your population would sinusoidally oscillate between E and S and E and S and back and forth. And that would just simply, um, you know, create this uh, time dependent populations, but instead we have coherences. So we can also think of the coherence as oscillating. We have uh, the polarization and the spin. And so if we sort of have some fraction of population going from, or amplitude going from E to S, then we go from having a polarization coherence to a spin coherence. So that's how we're going to think about uh, the memory is sending in a signal which establishes a polarization coherence and then have that uh, coherently sort of transition to uh, being into a spin coherence. We um, state that we're in the ATS limit. So Otler town splitting is sort of the atomic physics uh, lingo for AC Stark splitting, which is another way to say this. But it's basically in the regime where we have a very strong coupling between these, these two levels here. And we can rewrite the system so that those two coupled levels create a new uh, coupled system where the spacing between them is just equal to the amplitude of that um, of the electric field, which is related to the Rabi frequency. So if we have a regular absorption from G to E, um, in the absence of that coupling, you would just get some Lorentzian line shape. Um, but when you turn the coupling on, it actually just splits the resonance. And so to be in this ATS regime, um, here's the experimental data, we want to turn on this, this field here, this coupling field, strong enough so that we've actually split these two levels. And we'll see why that's important in a minute. So we consider the ATS regime the one where this um, coupling is actually greater than the spontaneous emission lifetime from the excited state. And what's that saying is that these uh, oscillations are going to be coherent because they happen faster than the spontaneous emission can happen. You want to have this coherent dynamics happen um, and be able to ignore spontaneous emission. Sorry, so, can I ask Yeah. Uh, could you go back to the last slide? Yeah, whoops, I can try. There we go. Uh, so, but you want this uh, omega c to be actually greater than the uh, splitting in, that is intrinsic between E and S to actually get the E plus S and E minus S. Is that not right or? No, so so this intrinsic split it like this is not really relevant in a way because we worked in a, I guess I've sort of skipped into a dress state basis over here um, for these states and so uh, in this stress basis, the because these are coupled, they're sort of at the same energy level in the stress basis, and then the splitting um, creates the additional sort of yeah energy separation between these levels. I see. So so because in my I mean just simply thinking, I would think that basically if they're close in energy, then uh, if I turn on a coupling, I get E plus S and E minus S. But if they're very far in energy, I would get one level that's more like S and one level that's more like E. But maybe I'm so, I mean, this, this coupling is independent of what's going on with G, right? So it, it's sort of, in, if we just think of the two level system, um, th these levels are coupled to each other. Um, and I mean, you can think of it in, without the stress state picture that if you have some weak signal sort of probing this transition here, then this um, is sort of oscillating really quickly between each other. So any like amplitude that gets into E starts undergoing these Rabi oscillations. And that's actually what causes the splitting is the, is the fast. So it's sort of independent of what this splitting is here. It doesn't really come into the problem. OK. All right. OK. Thank you. All right. Any other questions I'm happy to answer throughout here? So all right. So yeah, we can show that we're in this regime of ATS splitting and that, uh, as expected, the um, the splitting between these peaks scales is the square root of the power. So it goes like the electric field as it should for um, a Rabi oscillation for two levels. 
So if you want to go ahead and actually consider the dynamics carefully, uh, you can do so through something called the Maxwell block equations, which are just um, considering the electromagnetic fields and the three level system that we've got. But instead of writing it in terms of the levels, we look at it in terms of the dynamics of this quantum field, which is the signal field coming on, on this transition. And then your polarization and spin coherences, which are these sort of operators that I defined earlier. So this looks a little bit complicated, but we can simplify it just um, for the purposes of this talk. And one of the simplifications is that this excited state um, a lifetime is much less than this um, coherent Robbie flopping. So basically meaning that this term is much less than this. And with that simplification, we can drop a bunch of terms and we see that we get a fairly simple dynamic. So we, if we concentrate just on the sector of these uh, coherences, you can see that the polarization is coupled to the spin coherence and spin coherence is coupled to the polarization coherence. And so this is the kind of differential equation you can solve in a first year waves course and, and just get a simple harmonic um, description of these polarization coherences. It's a little bit complicated, of course, because you also couple in this electric field, uh, but you can see it just directly maps to the polarization. And so the idea is if you have an electric field uh, which is coming in, it creates a polarization coherence. That polarization coherence then Robbie flops into a spin coherence and then back into a polarization coherence. And that polarization coherence then reestablishes an electric dipole moment, which creates an electric field output. And then without any losses in the system, you would just imagine, this is a very cartoon calculation, by the way, it just oscillates between sort of spin and polarization back and forth. And every time the polarization is great, big, the electric field gets emitted um, because of that. And so you might ask, okay, well, that's a nice, you know, quantum dynamics of a three level system. How is it a memory? And the idea of the memory is just that, okay, well, if we actually go ahead and solve these equations with all of the um, loss terms, sort of with realistic ish values, um, if you send in the electric field here, so sorry, these um, got out of order here, but you send in the electric field, which is establishing a photonic coherence, creates the polarization coherence, and then out of phase with that, you get a spin coherence, back to a polarization coherence, and then you get an electric field back out. So on the top plot here, we're just looking at sort of what the electric field in is, and then the darker pink is the electric field out. And so with the control field on all the time, this blue line, we just see a recovery of that electric field coherence after a time which is related to one period of that Robbie oscillation, which is just depending on what the power of that uh, control signal is. And so we can turn it into an on-demand memory, which is a nice thing. Whoops, um, go back here. Oop. There we go. We turn off the control field at the exact time that we have uh, maximized the spin coherence. We've sent it in the electric field, created the polarization coherence, which is then oscillated into spin coherence, turn off the field, and then turn it back on again. We just restart the dynamics at some later time. So this uh, simulation is assuming that there's no ground state decoherence, and so we can just preserve that signal for as long as we want, and then restart the, those dynamics, and then the electric field output uh, comes at a later time. So that's the nice thing about the atomic system is that we can turn on and off these couplings at will and um, sort of get this on-demand kind of memory. One of the nice things about this method is that it doesn't depend on the actual shape of the control fields. Instead, it only depends on the control field area. So you can kind of think about it as if we integrate what that control field is over some time, that signal duration just has to sort of encapsulate one Robbie period, regardless of what the shape of that um, control field signal looks like. So as long as it meets this condition, which in the units we use is 2 pi, we go from having a full polarization coherence to a full uh, spin coherence. And so if we want to change the shape of our pulses, we can do that. And it turns out if you use sort of smoother, more Gaussian-like pulses, say for the input control signal, which is now that blue dashed line, we get a better mapping into the spin coherence. And then we wait some time, and then we can again have that signal come out and then get our, reestablish our polarization coherence, which sends the electric field back out. And so as I'll show later, you can actually change the height or the width of this pulse and actually change the shape uh, of these output pulses. And that can be used not only for memory, but for also manipulating these quantum uh, signals eventually. Okay, so uh, one thing we can also look at is what's actually going on when we're storing the spin um, coherence. And I haven't really talked about any spatial dependence, but what's actually going on inside is that we've sent two beams at a, at a collection of atoms and they have slightly different frequencies from one another. What that's gonna do is actually set up sort of a standing wave or, or just some interference pattern in the atoms. And so 
we get a superposition that is actually spatially dependent. You can write it out, sorry, I'm using my mouse here, but we can write it out as a sort of um, collective state here, where this is for one atom, but we can uh, write that sort of as a sum over all possible atoms in the system. And so we get a situation where we have sort of ground state atoms at the nodes and then superpositions um, elsewhere. So for co and counterpropagating beams, you get very long wavelength spin waves, but we also want to consider that if we can add an angle between them, we can get very short wavelength uh, spin waves as well. Um, so this is going to come into the story about storage time later, depending on these angles. But one nice thing about, you can also think about this, is it's another mechanism to think about what's actually going on in this memory. What we're doing is sending two, well, if I go back actually, sending two um, basically uh, beams of light in, and what they're doing is interfering with each other. They interfere and they're basically imprinting their pattern of phase into the atoms. And this actually is very much like a hologram. So what we're doing is having some interference pattern and we're storing the electric field amplitude and phase because we're interfering these beams with one another in the atoms and they can actually preserve that information. What we do for recall is then send one of those beams, an identical beam back, and that like a hologram, it's going to basically diffract off of this diffraction grading that we've created inside of the atoms and create an outgoing beam that has the same characteristics as the ingoing beam. So it's a lot like a hologram uh, when you just, you know, shine the same reference beam in and get the sort of picture or whatever back out. And so what we're doing is really just recreating uh, the signal beam that comes back out of it. So I, I like this picture. Um, a lot, and it's one of these things on the back burner is actually to, to formalize it a little bit more and see what we can get out of that, um, sort of from a classical standpoint. So, um, okay, so that's the ATS memory. If there's any questions, feel free to pipe up about that. Um, but one question we often get is, is it actually different than EIT? So it looks very much the same. For an EIT memory, you have two beams that, that couple this. Um, but you are working in the regime for EIT where you actually have a dark state. So there's a coherence between these two beams. In our situation, we don't actually need these beams to be coherent with one another. We actually use different lasers uh, to do this. Um, and so we don't have this dark state interference that you would get from EIT. The nice thing about EIT is that um, you get this sort of, instead of uh, two distinct peaks, you get a transparency window just sort of within a single Lorentzian um, where you get very high and very steep dispersion. So you get the slow, slow light phenomenon. And the way memory works in that situation is that you let a signal come in, it slows down so much, it gets trapped inside of your sample, you turn off the coupling, it's stuck there. It's the same kind of spin wave as we have um, that I just described. And then you turn back on the coupling and then the slow light continues and moves its way out. The thing that's difficult with EIT is that you have to fit your signal within this very narrow bandwidth. And that means you have to use very long and time signals or very, as I said, low bandwidth. Whereas for the ATS, we can work with very broad signals. So you can see these frequency scales are sort of differing by a factor of 20. Um, we can use very broadband signals. Um, and we basically have absorption sort of just in two places. But that sort of works well enough. And the other nice thing about actually the, the dynamics is that we sort of sweep this absorption back and forth um, in one cycle. And we can kind of cover the whole bandwidth. So um, although it looks the same from the outset, and in fact, ATS is just a, a high power limit of EIT. The mechanisms for storage are actually quite different. And so we spent some time looking at that too. Um, I have a quick question. Is it okay yeah. if I ask a quick question about yeah. uh, the, maybe on the previous slide, just to clarify, because you've got the picture right there. Uh, you explained that the state S is really a spin wave. So you couple into, you believe- Oh, this is wrong. Yeah, it should be, this should be an S here. That's the question. Yeah, yeah. no, I understand. Uh, okay. but, but there isn't just one spin wave in principle, right? So you've got a quasi-continuum of spin waves uh, for different K modes and you, you, you couple into only one? Or is it possible that you couple into some distribution of those spin waves? So, based, so different K modes, so you're thinking just because the, the beams are not quite like plane wave? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I guess that's true. There's some slight, we, I mean, we try to work as much in the play, plane wave regime as possible, but I, um, yeah, you could in principle think about different spin waves. And actually this is one of the ways that you can do multi-mode storage is actually on purpose to send in different uh, spatial modes and then right. read out just the ones that you want. Can um, you also introduce an electric field gradient to just sort of mess things up if you want to? That's right. Yeah. So this is actually one of, in the, um, one of these 
faster or one of the fast memory schemes is called uh, GEM, which is gradient echo memory. So they actually intentionally send in uh, a magnetic field gradient so that you're addressing uh, different frequencies on the way in and then you reverse it and then you can sort of get them on the way out. And actually, if you people are starting to talk now about doing like AC Stark shifts where you have say one of these um, digital mirror devices or spatial light modulators where you can tailor the potential really carefully and then you could say, you know, the, this part of the cloud, I'm storing this piece of information and I can send it out and, and do that kind of, um, yeah, sort of fun playing around with the different, um, different modes and frequency and in space. Okay, thanks a lot. So, yeah, so the differences between EIT and ATS, um, there's basically the mechanism is different. So we spent a whole paper looking into this, if, if you're interested. But the, the upshot is basically that EIT, uh, you have this very narrow frequency, which means that the time is very long. Uh, but the advantage is you actually get, you can get higher efficiencies because you don't have any excitation into this excited state where there is always going to be a little bit of loss due to spontaneous emission. So in that case, there's no polarization coherence excited. Um, whereas with the ATS, you can work much faster, but you are exciting polarization coherence. So there is some chance of some loss there. Uh, but in the time domain picture, sort of the shapes of what's happening, basically what we can do look at in the lab is just these red signals and they look very much the same. It's just on a very different time scale. So, um, so they're very much connected, but the, the, this sort of mechanism can be quite different between them. Um, and so what we were able to show is that uh, there are different regimes where you should use one or the other. The basic idea is that ATS works well, even if you have low optical depths, which means you don't necessarily absorb very much of the light. Um, you can get rather high efficiencies um, very quickly for low optical depths, but you sort of plateau. And this plateau is because of spontaneous emission. However, with EIT, because you don't, you're not sensitive to spontaneous emission, you can eventually get higher uh, efficiencies, but you have that at the expense of much higher optical depth. So that's just harder to do in the lab. And then the other thing we looked at is just bandwidth. And so for low bandwidth, EIT is going to basically always win, but there's a regime of higher bandwidth where this ATS memory uh, can beat out uh, EIT memory. So the message here is that they're both good. It just depends on what you're looking for. But high bandwidth is actually really nice because it lets you work basically with signals that are fast, but also a lot of single photon emission sources have very large bandwidths. And so you, if you want to be able to in interact with a single photon source, say from a nonlinear crystal, you'd want to be able to work at high bandwidth. Okay, so that's sort of the end of the, the theory part, um, the model. Um, I'll move into talking about some experiments for the last part of the talk here. So we, as I mentioned, um, are called Adam's Lab. And so we sort of had this, this tool and we designed this experiment actually to do the BEC and quantum simulation experiments. And um, my postdoc, Erhan Saglamiruk, has some experience in quantum memory and just sort of said, you know, let's try this out because this is actually a really nice system. And if, you know, we can get it to work, um, it could be really great. And, and it has been. So this is our BEC machine, um, just top view. What it is, uh, for the first set of experiments, we just used uh, laser cooled atoms. So not a BEC, um, but we worked with, in that case, about two to the eight atoms. Uh, you can actually see a sample here in the center. This is a laser cooled gas rubidium 87 atoms and it's actually this like pink blob. You can see it with your eye because the light that we use 780 nanometers is um, just outside the, the range of what our eyes can generally see. These experiments we worked at what's actually considered a very low optical depth of only about three um, and that's again just um, e to the minus three absorption if you, if you don't know that metric um, and a control power of about 10 megahertz. So we're just sort of on the hairy edge of being in the ATS regime but, um, but we are there. So uh, we basically have two a signal and a control that we mix on a beam splitter, send them into the MOT, and then we uh, split off the control and measure the signal um, because we actually use different polarizations for these in this case. And so the first demonstrations we showed that we can sort of see this um, basic characteristic of on-demand memory where we send in our signal in the light pink and, and retrieve a signal in the dark pink for either constant control, turning it on and turning it, turning it off and back on again, or using these Gaussian like pulses. And you can see for the Gaussian pulses, um, the control, the output signal actually looks a little nicer. So we were able to sort of shape um, the output using that um, pulse area mechanism. Uh, we also showed that we can do this in different regimes. So we can, um, sorry, I think this slide got in by accident, but this is basically just the, uh, 
showing the differences between EIT and ATS. And so we can get so close to the EIT, EIT regime, um, but again, we're working on much longer timescales, whereas for the ATS, we're working much uh, closer. And so our EIT efficiency is not very good, and that's in large part because our absorption is low, because we have very low optical depth. So in our system, where we have this limited uh, resource of just how, how dense the atoms are, EIT just doesn't work very well, whereas the ATS memory uh, worked quite a bit better. We were able to show that this um, signals were coherent. So we, uh, to do that, we sent in um, a signal and then at the time when we were looking at the output, we sent in a second reference signal uh, to interfere with the output. And we can see interference either constructive, this large pink signal, or destructive is this wiggles uh, of dark signal at the bottom. And we get a visibility of about 90%. So it's not perfect, but it's actually quite good. Um, showing that the, the phase of the input signal is related to the phase of the output signal. And that's one of these metrics that we would like to have if we're going to store truly quantum signals. Uh, we're also able to do pulse shaping. So I mentioned this earlier, um, but just as a simple demonstration, we're able to sort of write signals in. This pink is the input signal with the control signal in the blue that's quite broad. Um, but then if we make that narrower and increase the um, intensity, we can narrow the signal output by a factor of two in this case from say 60 nanosecond width to 28 nanosecond width and we can go the other way as well. So write narrow signals and read out broader ones. We've actually got uh, some data showing that um, we can do this more like a factor of 10 but we haven't actually made the plots up yet. So um, The other neat thing we can do is to do temporal beam splitting. So we have um, an ability to sort of send signals between two different degrees of freedom, one being the spin and the other sort of the electric field output. And um, the way to think about that is that the actual memory operation itself is like a beam splitter. So we have a signal coming in, which is the electric field, and we have some um, coherence in the atomic degree of freedom, sort of on the horizontal axis. And so when we apply the control beam, that's like saying, okay, let's stick a beam splitter into the system. And that control can turn the signal into a spin, that's the storage, or it can turn the stored beam into a signal, and that's the retrieval. So if we think of this like a beam splitter, we can just um, show, you know, a simple memory operation is like, yeah, like I just said, sending in a signal, turning it into spin, and then getting it back out again as an electric field. But the nice thing about beam splitters is that they don't have to be complete. So we can actually, instead of using um, a full 2 pi pulse to retrieve our signals, we can do it sort of in halves or in quarters, say, where we get half the signal out um, at one time bin and then the other half out later, or we can do that sort of up to four times, depending on how powerful our control signal is. So you can see the control signal in this case starts weaker, gets higher, 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 as we want to get all of the spin out at the end. And we can show that this is a, also a coherent process where if we store now two, sort of two signals in uh, with the beam splitter, depending on the phase of the second signal, we either get constructive or destructive interference in the spin mode here where um, we either sort of send the electric field out initially or turn it into spin and then get it out later. And so we can do experiments that start to look a lot like quantum optics using um, these atoms, the, the light matter interaction that we have as sort of the beam splitter in this case. And so this could be very powerful for actually doing quantum information processing. Uh, the next step was to look at the single photon level. So we don't have true single photon sources in terms of um, you know, number statistics in the lab, uh, although we are working on that right now. But to start, we just attenuated a coherent source, so took a laser and made it really weak and uh, sent that into the, into the system as our signal. Um, one thing that we did that's different here is actually we changed the angle. So for the early experiments, we had a two degree angle between the, the signal and control just to be able to separate them. Um, to physically separate control from signal, but um, you get a little bit of noise leaking from the control beam into the signal beam in that case. And we don't want, and if we're working at the signal, single photon level, we don't want any extra light around. So what we do is um, increase that angle. So the control is at a very large angle. And that means that we get almost no noise into the signal um, detection when we're doing the single photon counting. What that means is that the spin wave looks very different in this case, and so that is something we have to keep in mind as we do these experiments. So you remember the spin wave for a low angle is going to be a very long wavelength spin wave, whereas for a high angle you get very, a very close spin wave coupling. But it turns out that, again, we can do this at the single photon level, so we actually have single photon counting capabilities now, and if we send in the signal, we get our retrieval, and this demonstration was just after 200 nanoseconds. But we found it was very low noise. So we get a signal to noise of around 40. 
uh, which maps to a fidelity of around 97%, meaning that if we were to use quantum signals with a 97% probability, we would get the signal out that we had put in. And so that was just a first demonstration, but that's, yeah, again, something we can work to make even better. Uh, we can do the same kind of beam splitting um, with the single photon level pulses. So this is just the same demonstration I showed earlier. Um, and so that's a nice um, capability. So the last thing I want to talk about here is moving towards colder atoms. So the storage times that we used in these cases, as you can see, are on the sort of hundreds of nanoseconds level. And that is because uh, we have thermal diffusion uh, of that spin wave. So basically, after some time, the spin wave starts to diffuse into each other and it becomes a race. So because we have the capability of doing VCs, we wanted to uh, try that out with the quantum memory. So here's just the, the slide showing that we can make Bose-Einstein condensates. Um, as we lower the temperature, we get atoms that are very dense and very cold. Um, and you can see that these are momentum space distributions. So the momentum is very narrow, meaning that the, um, the atoms are quite cold. And we're able to do the same kind of memory experiments here. So here we're plotting memory efficiency versus the temperature of the cloud. And so this pink area is sort of the thermal regime. And as we cool the cloud down, we see the memory efficiency is getting higher and higher and higher. Eventually, and I'll talk about why it drops here. And that's basically as the atomic density, so the BEC density is getting higher. So um, we're basically able to absorb more of the light and, and keep it stored as we make the atoms colder. And the system is also more efficient because we're measuring this at a particular time. And so there's been less decay of the storage um, just because of time in this colder sample. Uh, you can see we've actually plotted this for two different sizes. These are the size of the probe beam, uh, the radius of the probe beam. And for smaller ones, the efficiency is better. As we make the probe beam larger, we actually see a decrease in efficiency. And that's due to the fact that um, when the cloud is large, when it's hot, the, uh, the cloud can absorb all of the light that we send at it. But as the atoms get colder, they actually get smaller. And that means that some of the beam that we're sending at them isn't absorbed just because it's not hitting the atoms. And so we see that drop of efficiency as the atoms get colder because they're getting smaller and we're able to show that that is why. So um, we were sort of limited with our optics just in these first experiments, but if we can make these beams smaller and we could imagine doing you know, close to the diffraction limit where we can get closer to one micron, then we could get a lot better efficiency in the system. Um, so the lifetime we were able to show can be as high as say 15 microseconds, so that's quite a bit higher. Uh, and we think that we're limited right now by magnetic field fluctuations. So those two ground states actually uh, do have Zeeman structure to them. So there's a little bit of magnetic dephasing that can happen. And um, again, we're not shielding super well right now. So we think that this is something that we can beat down with just some technical prowess. Um, and we also can see that it is a coherent process. Um, Again, the signal to noise is very good, uh, even for low sig uh, sing sort of single photon level characterization. So we think that we can do this at the quantum level. Um, and yeah, we think that this is gonna be a very nice memory um, if we get real quantum signals. So that's sort of the next step. If we wanna think about you know, what is actually limiting the storage time, again, we can go back to what are the decoherence mechanisms. Um, like I said earlier, it's really just this spin wave. So when the spin wave is very long, if we have thermal diffusion going on, um, it's not gonna mess up this sort of hologram that we, we've set into the system. Uh, another decoherence mechanism is just the magnetic field inhomogeneity. So these G and S levels are sensitive, as I just said, to the, to the magnetic fields. And so there's some um, fluctuations due to that. And then here, yeah, is the thermal diffusion picture. So if we have a, a large spin grating, uh, we're more robust against this thermal diffusion because of just the spacing, whereas when we have the large angle between the beams, we're more sensitive to it. And so um, working as we do right now with this large angle to get rid of the other noise means that we're more sensitive to thermal diffusion and decoherence. So sort of working around these problems as a technical one that we think we can, we can tackle. So I'm gonna skip that. Um, basically, we've learned that we can do high bandwidth and low noise. Um, quantum memory was fairly good efficiencies, so up to 30% in the BCs and, and long lifetimes. Um, we know that low temperature means low thermal diffusion, even though that there's a trade-off between this high spatial periodicity. Um, and we know that if we get to a smaller beam size, we can be more efficient. So there's a lot of things we can still work on here and uh, to make this memory even better yet. 
uh, we can actually calculate what some of these are, but we predict that, like I said, if we get to sort of a one micron beam, if we cool down the atoms with the same parameters we have right now, we can get very close to 100% efficiencies, maybe 95. Um, and that the thermal lifetime, we should be able to improve to sort of the hundreds of milliseconds level, which um, other problems become due to the sort of actual character of the BEC come into place. We have um, two mechanisms, which are inelastic collisions and actually the recoil motion um, of, of the atoms limit to a few hundreds of milliseconds, but that's already doing quite a bit better than we are right now. And um, for the bandwidths we're working in, we can also show that this, um, the noise is going to be much lower for the ATS protocol than for EIT. So it's another advantage I don't have time to go into, but um, we can see that there really are a lot of advantages to working in this high power ATS regime. All right, so I'm basically out of time, but let me just take a few minutes to um, dwell on some other experiments we've been doing lately, and that's thinking about microwaves. So it's related in that we're looking at the sort of same three level system. Um, and as I said earlier, that we sort of have this forbidden transition between our two ground states, which I've drawn in a slightly different geometry here. But because the, even though they're electric dipole forbidden, it is a magnetic dipole allowed transition. So if you can get a strong enough oscillating magnetic field at 6.8 gigahertz, then you can address these levels directly. And so that's the motivation for working in this microwave regime. And the nice thing about it is that you can connect sort of microwave and optical all coherently through the same atom. You can think about things like quantum transduction or even in the future looking towards quantum memories of microwaves directly. So the system that we're working with to start off with is just a, a glass box full of rubidium atoms inside of a uh, copper can that's about the size of my fist. Um, and that is resonant to this hyperfine transition in our, um, in our rubidium atoms. So we're able to see coherent Rabi oscillations of these hot atoms, and then we optically pump them to the different state. And we're, what we're doing is actually probing the transmission of an optical beam while applying microwaves inside of this cell. A nice experiment that we, we showed was that we can sort of do a double resonant situation where we have um, an optical beam that's resonant on this transition and a microwave beam that's trans resonant on this transition. And when we do that, when we have the microwaves on, we have this coupling so that the optical beam is sort of can see what's going on with the microwaves. And just very quickly, we're able to show that we can couple uh, audio signals. So we actually put a modulation of an audio signal on the microwave and then read it out with an optical signal. And here is this original, it's a song that we downloaded off of YouTube that we, um, took in from say a computer, we modulated a microwave source, sent that into the atoms, and then actually read out with an optical beam onto a photodiode. And so we're able to transduce this modulation from a microwave signal to an optical signal. So that was a nice um, result using this warm atom system. And more recently, we're working on things like polarization switches. So using the actual structure of the atoms to um, allow or disallow different polarizations. Uh, to be transmitted through the system. So uh, yeah, the next steps for this are to look for EIT or ATS um, kind of interactions between the light and matter and seeing if we can use the microwaves to, to modify that. And then eventually looking at things like microwave to optical transduction. So this is also um, motivated by using this hybrid quantum system that we're setting up with the dilution fridge. Eventually we'd like to be able to, you know, send um, microwave signals into, say, optical um, fibers or into free space to things like satellites. So we're starting to think about actually hooking these sorts of things up to real live quantum internet kind of systems. So the next, um, basically in summary, uh, we've created this Otler Towns protocol for quantum memory and manipulation, which has reduced a lot of the technical demands. So like I said, optical depth, but actually lower laser power than a lot of the other systems. It's inherently a broadband and efficient memory. Uh, we've shown that we can do classical signal storage and manipulation also at the single photon level and that by moving to cold atoms we can increase the storage time uh, making cold atoms uh, a versatile medium for quantum memory. Uh, some of the next steps are looking more at the microwaves and also just to use real quantum states in this quantum memory to um, you know get a real element for a quantum information network. Uh, so to finish uh, here's a recent picture of us uh, out in the quad and uh, I'd like to really thank um, Erhan Saglamira, who's the postdoc who's led a lot of this quantum memory work. And um, so where is he? He's here. And uh, Anindya Rastogi, who's done a lot of the calculations and more recently has taken up the, uh, the new generation of experiments on this quantum memory system. 
So with that, I'm happy to take some more questions. Thank you very much, uh, Lindsay. That was a really great talk. Um, we do have some time for questions. You can either write them into the chat or you can raise your hand. I see some clapping. I don't see any hands. Oh, I see a hand. Bill. Yeah, thanks a lot for the great talk. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, uh, have you ever considered doing uh, simulations of simple lattice models? Uh, so if, if you do those simulations in k-space, then you only need to worry about simulating one of the k-modes per unit time. And then you can think of the, the three levels of your system as being three distinct sites uh, in a unit cell on a lattice. Um, I see. So is this so, like so the stuff that Bryce Gadway is doing at Illinois? The same? I'm not sure. OK. So I think, yeah, there, there is some work um, in momentum space. So yeah, treating like a, a momentum space lattice, I guess, is the way people yeah, talk exactly. about this. And actually, there's a neat experiment out of China where they do this in a warm atom system as well. And so it's yeah. one of these on the list of things to look well, for. We have a proposal to, to do this for a topological quantum walk. OK. Uh, it looks like it's pretty well set up for your system. So maybe we can talk about it. That'd be really, really cool. Actually, our, we're thinking a lot about geometrical phases in the, in the BC system right now, too. So um, we okay. related to that. Great. OK, thanks a lot. Any other questions? I'll give you a second, and then I'll ask one of my own. So I, I, was, I was wondering, um, I mean, I, I noticed that essentially you didn't seem to care about the Doppler distribution in your warm atom cloud. Yeah. Um, easily, I mean, you, I have this picture that the ATS is, is always always has to be on resonance. So why, why doesn't the Doppler distribution matter? So we're, well, there's, a, um, for the ATS, we it would. So we would actually want to tailor the, maybe I should just draw here. Um, I think we, you know, you have this broad Doppler distribution of um, atoms. So I think what we would actually do is like spectral hole burning with the um, in the Doppler sample to get ATS memory to work with the warm atoms is probably how it works. But the other neat thing, if you go to the microwave regime, is that the Doppler shift for microwaves is basically also zero. And so um, that's one of the nice things about doing this sort of all microwave stuff is that you do address all of the atoms equally. Right. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, but yeah, we had a we actually had a really good undergrad who started this, this whole burning things, but it was like right at the end of the summer one year, and we haven't haven't gone back to it. But. Any other questions? I have more, but <laughs> I don't want to dominate if others. So, uh, since I don't see any more hands, I'll just I'll ask one more question, and I'll I'll let you uh, relax a little. Um, so, re regarding the efficiency, so looking at this naively. Um, it looks like basically everything gets better as your control intensity increases. Yeah. Is that And so is there any kind of limitation to just pushing hard in that direction? It's, um, so I guess part of it is that, uh, I didn't draw the full structure of the rubidium atoms, but uh, I'm in the wrong mode here. Um, you would actually run into, the, the stronger your control, the more off-resonant transitions you're gonna make. So the excited state splitting. Uh, so I guess once your control power becomes, you know, of the order of the excited state splittings, it's gonna be a problem. So rubidium is actually nice because those are quite big, but um, not infinite. So I guess, you know, 200, 267 megahertz to the next level. So um, actually one other thing we're gonna do is work, we're moving to like a 795 laser to work with the D1 transition instead of the D2 transition, which actually will uh, prevent some of that problem too. Just fewer levels around. Bill? <laughs> yeah, since no one else is raising their hands, I also have lots of questions. <laughs> so uh, when you showed the spin decoherence, uh, yeah. this down to the spin coherence, uh, I think you said you were pretty sure that it was due to magnetic field fluctuations. Uh, is that right? Or, or was it due to... Uh, well, due so we think... Um, so we don't have a lot of data, I guess. Is, <laughs> so we, this is something we'd like to investigate more. But um, basically that this difference happens here. So we see a change from temperature of what this lifetime is. So here we do think the thermal is probably dominating. But then um, we know that the thermal... Uh, lifetime should not give us, it should be much longer than it is at this temperature. So there's something else. So there's actually two, they, these things scale differently, but 
I mean, seeing exponential decays with two time constants and this kind of data is not really feasible just yet. So, um, but yeah, so we think that it's probably magnetic field dephasing at this level, but actually um, thermal lower on. Okay. So. And since you talked about this combined optical and magnetic control, uh, I was wondering if it would be possible to do noise spectroscopy. So can you do oh, yeah. pi pulses on this uh, spin wave that would allow you to uh, you know, do a sequence of pi pulses with varying uh, separation to sample the spectral density of the noise to see exactly what it is? Yeah, I think that's actually a really interesting path is like to actually then use our, our tools from like BC to actually look at the BCs and see what's going on. But yeah, these sort of pi pulses are interesting. There's a group in Poland, um, I can't, it's Wasch Washovitz or something, uh, the last name of this um, relatively new PI. And they are actually doing some of this where they're using AC Stark shifts. So actually sending in these tailored beams of light and manipulating the spin waves. Um, in, in a quantum memory situation kind of like this. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Or should I continue on with mine? <laughs> I'll ask one more, one more. I mean, that's it I'll bite with the question of why is ATS so much low, lower noise than EIT? So, um, Partly it's just that it's lower optical density. So we don't have as many uh, chances for, um, for atoms to, to create the noise, I guess. Uh, might be the easiest. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Oops, oh, I'm just, sorry. <laughs> oh, by accident, but. Um, yeah, and I guess, I mean, the, they are similar, but yeah, I guess it's just that we can work in this lower optical density regime. Otherwise, I think the mechanisms are pretty similar for the noise between the two cases. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, can can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, ah. Lily? Yes. I'm Danny Morris from from Sherbrooke. Thank you, Lindsay, for this uh, great talk. You haven't talked that much about uh, the influence of the density of atoms in these experiments. Right. What, yeah. What would, be, what would be the effect of, of it is hidden in there. So it's this optical density, which is directly proportional to the density. So um, you basically want to absorb as much of the light as possible. And so I mean, let me see, actually let me reshare here. Um, I think I should have a picture that shows this. So, um, okay, I have to go back here. Let me see. So some of these actual initial um, calculations. Oh, it's not controlling it. There we go. So the density is sort of how much of the, we'll tell you how much of the light is absorbed. And in these calculations, I didn't talk about it, but these different colors here are actually at different points in the cloud. So at the entrance of the cloud where the signal first hits, you get uh, full coherence. Um, and then the field sort of decays through the cloud. So in this ATS picture, you actually get a decay. Uh, and what you want is for your whole signal to actually decay through the length of the cloud. So you need enough optical density that you've stored the whole signal. Um, and if you don't have enough optical density, then yeah, some of the signal will just leak through right away. But that number is actually not very big. It's just um, something like, you know, we work at the optical density of three, probably by the time you get to an optical density of five, you're, you're storing most of the light, like high, a few nines of, of percentages. With EIT, the optical density um, comes into the dispersion. So the more atoms you have, the steeper this dispersion. So you want a high optical density because you want more, a slower light. So it's not just the absorption, but it's also in the dispersion um, for EIT. And so there's a higher demand on optical density for that system compared to just absorbing the light in the system that we're using. Okay, thank you. All right. Last questions? If not, let's thank Lindsay again for a great talk. Uh, it's been really interesting to hear about what you've been up to. Well, thank you very much for the invitation again. It's nice to connect.